Today's lecture by Dr. Nathan MacDonald begins by looking at a large tomb on the lower slope of Mount Olives. The Mount of Olives is the most important burial site in Judaism. This tomb is known as Absalom's monument. Absalom was the son of King David, one of Israel's earliest kings. According to 2 Samuel 18, 18, he built a monument because he had no sons that would continue his name. There's one thing we can be certain about. This was not his tomb because it was actually built almost a thousand years later, just before the time of Jesus. It is really important not to bring our later understandings of the nature of death, resurrection, heaven and hell when interpreting the past. Come with me now as we join Dr. Nathan MacDonald. Where that monument is, is just right on the right hand side of this photograph, the little green area that you can see. And I'm going to walk down that valley um, and I'm going to walk uh, around the bottom of the photo, down to the bottom of the photo and along to the bottom uh, left hand corner. And I'm going to take you now to, some, to, a, to a place called um, Ketev Hinnom, which is down on the Hinnom Valley. And there we have some genuine Iron Age tombs. And these are tombs that come from the time of the southern kingdom, the kingdom of Judah. And as you can see, these tombs are hewn into the rocks. Now, I'm going to give you another photograph, and that is of a really interesting tomb, and this is tomb 25. Now, as you look at that photo, I hope I'm, I want to just point out a number of really interesting features to you. One of them is that you will notice, uh, just like with the tomb I showed you a minute ago, is that we have um, some, what we might think of as kind of benches. Basically, these are areas where bodies can be laid out. Um, and uh, they're laid out on these benches uh, when the body um, is first interred in the tomb. So very sh shortly after death, the body would be placed in the tomb on these benches. And if you look in this photo, you might be able to see one, two, three, four, five little indentations. Um, and those are indentations where the, the head of the deceased person would be placed. So you can see you could lay out five bodies um, on the, in, in the sort of central, in the central bench that you can see on this photograph. Now, when the body, uh, the bodies that have been laid here have, have decomposed um, so that there's nothing left uh, but the bones, there is a, a secondary stage of burial. The bones are gathered up and they're reinterred in a repository. Now, if you look at this photo, you'll see that the, the five little indentations um, and underneath the fifth indentation, you'll notice there's a there's a there's a little um, a, a little hole there with some stones in front of it, um, and that is a repository. Um, and it is in the, that repository that the bones were gathered up and um, uh, were, were were placed uh, in there. And that's a practice that we would call secondary burial. So you've got the primary burial where the body is first laid out to, to decompose. And then um, a secondary burial where the, the bones are collected up and, and deposited in the repository. Now, it's not just the bones that are placed in that repository, uh, but also um, a whole load of other materials. Um, and here, um, the, uh, here I've given you a, a photograph of the repository um, from, the, uh, from the Israel Museum. Um, and you can see that uh, there are a large number of pottery vessels. Um, there's also uh, uh, bone and ivory objects, uh, objects that have been carved from bone and ivory, uh, glass, uh, metal objects. Um, and one thing that I particularly want to mention is two silver amulets that were discovered here. Let me show you those two silver amulets now. Um, I've, I've kind of zoomed them up so they, 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 they look quite uh, large. And um, I'm going to zoom in a little bit closer um, onto one of them. So you can see, I hope on there, you'll notice, um, you'll notice that there's, there's quite a few kind of fracture marks on it, quite a few kind of crinkle marks. 
Um, and, and that's because the, the, the scroll, the, this, these amulets were sort of made out of very thin pieces of silver and, and were wound up uh, into a, into, almost into a, into a roll um, so that they could be worn. But you'll also notice uh, uh, right at the top, you may notice a few scratch markings. Now that is Hebrew. Um, it's probably, and you'll say to me, well, that's not the Hebrew that we know. That no, looks nothing like Hebrew letter that I've ever seen. And you're absolutely right. Because what you can see here is an earlier form of the Hebrew alphabet. So this is a form of the Hebrew alphabet before the, the, the much more common Aramaic alphabet was adopted, which is, which is the one that you, you, you're probably most familiar with. This is the alphabet that's called Paleo-Hebrew. Um, and, uh, and, and so on these amulets, there is actually some, there is some writing inscribed. Um, and, and here are the, 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 the script that's been inscribed on the two amulets. So this is the first one. Um, and you'll notice it's, it's a little bit broken. Um, the text that's, that's in the square brackets is text that has been restored, has been guessed at by, on the basis of the context. But basically we have something like this. We have a divine name in, in line one. Then we have the great, the covenant and graciousness to those who love him and those who keep his commandments. The eternal, blessing more than any snare and more than any evil. For redemption is in him, for Yahweh is our restorer and rock. May Yahweh bless you and may he guard you. May Yahweh make his face shine and then the uh, the, the, the inscription breaks off um, because we've lost uh, the, the remaining part of it. And let me show you the, the second one, which has a fairly similar text. May he or she, whoever it is that's being mentioned on this amulet, be blessed by Yahweh, the warrior, and the one who expels evil. May Yahweh bless you and guard you. May Yahweh make his face shine upon you and give you peace. I wonder as I read that text, or, or read both texts, whether any parts of it uh, reminded you of something that you may be familiar with. Uh, you may be familiar with some of this text, uh, particularly you might have heard it at the end of um, a service of Christian worship as a blessing at the end. Familiar? Well, we have something that is rather like the Aaronic blessing in Numbers chapter six, verses 22 to 27. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to Aaron and his son saying, thus you shall bless the Israelites. You shall say to them, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. This is a very famous text. It's a text that's often said as a blessing at the end of uh, services of worship. Um, and these two amulets are in fact the very earliest biblical text that we have. It dates to perhaps sometime in the seventh or the sixth century BCE. So this is by some distance, much earlier than the Dead Sea Scrolls and um, earlier than any other biblical text we have. So what we have here is, is, is a little bit of uh, the very earliest biblical text and it has been used it has been used as an amulet it has been wrapped up into a little ball and it has then been placed as an amulet maybe around the neck or dangling um, as, a, as a sort of frontlet or as a kind of um, uh, as a sort of a crown across the, across the head and this has been laid on somebody who has died um, and it has accompanied them uh, beyond death um, why have I mentioned this particular uh, case? Um, well, um, what I want to do is to, is, uh, well, I've mentioned this because I'm, it's a particularly beautiful example, I think. Um, uh, this amulet with its vision of uh, God's face continuing to shine upon the individual and God's presence being there and of giving light is, um, is a very important and beautiful picture of, um, of what somebody is trying to do for this corpse um, uh, in the moment of death. What, what is the purpose of an amulet? Why do you wear an amulet? Well, an amulet is what we would call an apotropaic device. It is a device that 
that averts evil. That's one of its purposes. It, it keeps away an evil eye, it keeps away um, some forms of evil, but that's how an amulet functions. It is, it is an object that, that manages to, to, to expel um, evil. And so we have this beautiful picture here of, of God protecting uh, the bearer even in death. Well, why might that be important? Well, in the ancient Israelite world, there is a, um, a, a they share a traditional view of death together with their neighbors in the ancient Near East of that the dead go down into the underworld. Um, and the underworld is a place that is dark and is dusty. It's, it's, not, a, it's not a place you want to go to. Um, and it's a place that is often in Hebrew text known as Sheol. Um, and that is a place that is the underworld. Um, we might think of it as sort of comparable to the Greek notion of Hades. Um, but, but to go to Sheol is not an attractive place to go. Um, here is a description, here's a poetic account of it in Psalm 88, where, where the psalmist compares uh, his, his illness and, and, the, and the situation that he finds himself to, to being in Sheol. For my soul is full of troubles and my life draws near to Sheol. I am counted amongst those who go down to the pit. I am like those who have no help, like those forsaken among the dead like the slain that lie in the grave, like those whom you remember no more, for they are cut off from your hand. You have put me in the depths of the pit, in the regions dark and deep. Your wrath lies heavy upon me and you overwhelm me with all your waves. So, um, so to go into the underworld, to, to go down to Sheol is, is not a happy experience and, and it is not one where one would expect to be resurrected from it. One doesn't come back from Sheol. Um, there's a beautiful picture of this in uh, 2 Samuel chapter 14, verse 14, where, where somebody called the wise woman of Tekoa expresses this view of, of what death is like, that it, that it is genuinely the end. She says, we must all die. We are like water spilled on the ground, which cannot be gathered up. So there is an expectation that, that, that when one dies, one goes down to the underworld, and this is not a world that one returns from. Now, in this context, the, the, the grave goods that we saw um, from the, uh, let me just take you back, for, in the Israel Museum, may, may well be really interesting because they indicate the, the need to provide uh, for the dead in the afterlife. The, afterlife the, the dead are usually portrayed as being uh, powerless, um, almost kind of ghost-like figures, they're unable to act on their own behalf. Um, and so, and so they are, they, we, we, we find graves uh, both here and, and elsewhere in Israel with, um, uh, with grave goods um, and sometimes with provisions of food. Um, now, a really interesting example of that, um, of the need to provide for the dead, is found in Deuteronomy 26. So Deuteronomy 26 tells us um, about uh, an Israelite bringing an offering to the temple. So they're bringing, they bring the offering to the temple and then they also, uh, they, it also talks about bringing the tithe. So the tithe is, 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 is a 10%, it's a, it's a certain percent of the harvest that is then given to those who are poor and, and without. And, 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 and when, the, when the Israelite makes this offering to those who are poor, um, he has to say the following words. I have removed the sacred portion from the house and I have given it to the Levites, the resident aliens, the orphans and the widows, you know, those, those who are poor, those without. In accordance with your entire commandment that you commanded me, I have neither transgressed nor forgotten any of your commandments. I have not eaten it while in mourning. I have not removed any of it while I was unclean and I have not offered any of it to the dead. I have obeyed the Lord my God doing just as you commanded me. Now, what's really interesting about this is that offering something to the dead is, is not seen here as a bad thing. You know, it, it, it's similarly as sort of eating something while you're mourning or, 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 um, or, or touching it when you're unclean. It's, it's not necessarily, it's, these things are not bad in themselves, but you can't sort of, you, you can't repurpose an offering. You can't sort of offer it to the dead um, and then sort of scoop it up afterwards and then sort of give it to, the, to, 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 to those who are poor. You know, that is deemed kind of inappropriate. Um, so what's really interesting about this is it shows that, that, that food was, was given to the dead, was felt important to nourish the dead, um, and, um, 
and, and that this wasn't prohibited, this wasn't seen as a, as, as a bad thing in and of itself. So we have it here mentioned in Torah, mentioned in uh, the books of uh, Moses, and yet it is not considered a prohibited practice to, to feed the dead. So that's one thing I wanted, you, uh, wanted to mention uh, this example for because of this idea of the underworld and what it tells us about it, about, their, about the Israelite sense of the underworld. Uh, but another reason I wanted to point it out to you was um, that these are, these are communal tombs, these are, these are family tombs. Um, and uh, you'll notice that the, the way that the, the practice of dealing with the dead allows for, for more occupants. So the idea is that you are laid down, you know, when, when you die, you are laid on these benches until your body decomposes. The bones are then removed to the repository, and in that way, you make space for an, another inhabitant. But also that the, the, the bones are all gathered together. And, 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 and death in ancient Israel is very much a kind of, it, it's, a, it's, it's a communal uh, moment. And uh, some biblical texts talk about being gathered with the ancestors and resting with them. So, for example, 2 Kings chapter 20, verse 21, uh, we're told Hezekiah slept with his fathers and Manasseh, his son, reigned in his place. So he, he, Hezekiah was, was gathered up into the, into the family tomb. Um, and then another quite interesting verse is Genesis 25, verse 17. Abraham breathed his last and died in a good old age, an old man and full of years and was gathered to his people. And, and this is a really interesting text because Abraham is not buried with his, with his ancestors because he migrated. Um, and this expression was gathered to his people seems only to be used with those like Abraham and Moses and Aaron who were, who were not buried with their family. But there, there, there seems to be some sense in which um, having lived a good life and having died at a good old age, one is still in some symbolic sense of kind of gathered to your own people. So this, the, this idea of being sort of interred in the family tomb and, and gathered with the bones of your ancestors is, 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 is being treat, treated here as a kind of symbol of what a good death looks like. And even if you die somewhere away from your ancestors, the, the good life is being gathered to your people in some sense. So to rest with the ancestors is a sign of a blessed life. Um, uh, the worst thing that could happen if you were an Israelite was to, was to die on the battlefield, to, to be exposed, to be away from the family too. So, so life and death is very much a matter of, um, of the community. So there's, there's no idea of being individually resurrected, but instead of kind of the continuity of, of one generation to the other. But the last thing I want to, to mention, and I'm, I, I kind of had a bit of also prepared on the origins of resurrection, which we, we may get to talk about in the, in the questions, but I'm going to sort of leave that to one side at the moment. Um, I just want to talk about uh, the last thing I want to draw attention to is the, is, is the sort of the stages of life and death. Um, and, and I think this also comes from these finds as well. Now, now, for us, I think we work with a very clear boundary between being alive and being dead. Okay, if you're alive, you're alive. If you're dead, you're dead. you can't be both alive and dead. Um, and the boundary line is very clear. Now, the Israelites, of course, were well aware that, you know, people who had died did, did not come back from the death, from, from being dead. But, but they also have a more kind of graduated sense of death. So death um, as a process, and, and we maybe see some of that here in the, the, the two stages of burial, the way in which uh, you are laid on the bench and then you are gathered up. So the, the, the Dying is a, is, is a process, and you, you see that also in some of the Psalms, where the Psalmist describes having a serious illness as, as already to have stepped into Sheol, to already be experiencing Sheol. And in this context, the, the Psalmist can appeal to God to, to be rescued from that predicament. So again, to go back to Psalm 88, here we see the, 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 the Israelite uh, sufferer describes his life as, you know, he's already gone down into Sheol. So um, for him, he's already, his experience is already akin to, to being death. So I think for us, if, if we think of illness as definitely, when we think of illness, we think of illness, you know, the person is alive. The one, one thing they're not, if they're ill, is dead. But for the Israelites, we might think of it as, as another way around. They, they thought of illness almost as, as kind of being dead, as being on the process, the, the, the move towards death, and almost as not being alive. 
So illness in many ways sort of sits for them, you know, almost on the other side of the boundary, um, or at least the boundaries for them are, are set in slightly different places. It's not such a thick line between life and death. It's much more between enjoying life and experiencing it and then being illness, being ill, which is, which is almost to have a uh, one step already into the grave. Mm -hmm.